IBC, Poet. I mean, I, I found Poet, be, in, as a newsletter writer, I found Poet because I was kind of looking at the periodic chart, looking for interesting ideas about, you know, just exotic elements on the periodic chart. And I encountered Poet because of gallium arsenide. So I go up to, I flew up to uh, Hartford, went over to University of Connecticut stores in the middle of a snowstorm. I mean, it was, I'm glad I did. I'm glad I, I'm glad I almost killed myself getting there because it was worth the trip but to, to meet the people, see what they're doing. I mean, and Jeff Taylor, who was not here today, is this brilliant, guy who worked at Bell Labs in the good old days when it was really Bell Labs, you know, and he had just made, he'd been working on this project on this quantum hole uh, uh, theoretical ideas, you know, bringing them to an application for decades, I mean, like 35 years or something like that. And then when Bell Labs, you know, kind of had their problems, they, they uh, you know, he, he went up to Yukon at, at stores. Uh, right about the time that United Technologies was closing down their research and development center and they wanted to get rid of all this really nice equipment that they had at United Technologies R&D Center, they gave it to him or I don't know, they sold it to him for a dollar or some ridiculous amount. So he's got this fabulous laboratory facility, fabricating facility up there at stores where he actually builds these, these chips. And in terms of the business idea, I mean, it, you know, just if you go back far enough, Poet started as a solar power company. You know, you take sunshine, you, fly, you shine it on, a, on your crystals, and out comes the electricity. Reverse that. You put the electricity in, and out comes the light. Coherent photons called lasers. Make them small. They're nano lasers. Make them really small. Put them on a chip. You've got optical computing. That's where Poet is coming from. That is the product, the service. Is it the right time? Well, we've got four years until Moore's Law runs out of, runs out of physics, okay? And four years in the world of this kind of tech, that's, that's, that's going to be a close call. It's going to be a photo finish, so to speak. You know, but can you trust the idea? I mean, you know, I, I, I've been there. I've seen it. I, you know, I will let you talk to Peter out there. I'll let you talk to somebody else about who they've talked to, who their partners are. You know, I mean, there are a lot of things that, you know, they can say, they can't say, there's things they've told me that I won't say, but I'll just say, ask them. Maybe they'll, maybe they, maybe, maybe they'll be able to tell you. I mean, you look at management. Can management manage? I mean, do they have the right people in the right jobs? I mean, the chief technology officer from Poet, who you met today, is the right guy in the right job. I mean, you know, he came from Fairchild Semiconductor. They know a few things about semiconductors, you know. He's the right guy to take Poet to where it needs to go. Uh, you know, a company like Poet, you know, I mean, is it, I mean, NASDAQ listing in the next couple of months, do you think that might, you know, improve the uh, visibility of the company? Well, you know, I'm inclined to think so. I mentioned at the very beginning, I mean, these TSX companies, these venture companies, are they are so beaten down, beaten into the dirt. I mean, could they go further? Yeah, things can always go further. There is that number zero, but... But I mean, these are companies with real management. They have real products. They have real ideas. They have de-risked themselves in certain ways, in certain shapes. I mean, if you tried to do what these guys have done, you know, fast and quick and easy, it wouldn't happen. I mean, you know, it, it's it's astonishing to think that, uh, that that the share price of some of these companies is lower now than it was, you know, a year ago, two years ago. I mean. And why look at Poet? I mean, it's it, technically in terms of people, in terms of their, their IP, in terms of where they are in the in the battle space of of getting their ideas and their products into the market. They are so much better now than when I first met them a little over a year ago. Uh, I mean, they are just they're they're so much better of a company in terms of people. I'm not knocking what they were. I'm just saying that they've gotten better. And so I look at this as as just value on sale, beaten down value uh, that, it, that is out there. And it's so de-risked. It's so much more de-risked than it used to be. So. Um, I would argue that Moore's Law from a technology perspective is becoming significantly more challenging, but the problem is the economics. The cost of developing each node is going up and the manufacturing cost of each of those nodes is going up. So if you're saving 30% 30 uh, 30 a year in cost, but it costs you 50% more layers for a FinFET to go um, in the manufacturing uh, environment, you haven't really saved any money. So I think the half-truth is, is that the economics of Moore's Law is stalling. 
the technology will continue, will do very well, um, but the economics are definitely, definitely slowing down. Um, consolidation in terms of M&A, clearly that's happening. I would argue this is not getting rid of competitors. You know, we're not, tech companies are too cheap to buy somebody to kill them. Uh, they're easier to kill them in the marketplace. They are broadening their asset base and they're collecting up the next set of assets for the next generation, which means they gotta have all the right pieces to serve the internet as things. And I would argue that's what we're seeing now in terms of in terms of the M&A. Um, finally, dividends and share repurchases. Uh, gosh, guess what happens when you put growth on top of those kind of things? Uh, you'll get some really nice multiples uh, going on in this space. So let me just dive into a couple of these different here. Again, the economics of Moore's Law. I talked about this a little bit. Um, the development costs are skyrocketing here, and that's what's holding this back. Um, in terms of FinFET, that's the 3D transistor that Intel's been pushing, where it costs 50% more layers to build on the chip to save 30%. That means your first generation of the FinFET technology won't save you any money, okay? And that's just the manufacturing cost, never mind the development cost. Um, that's a serious problem. Uh, EUV is a extreme ultraviolet. That's got to get rid of the light source that's used in photolithography. They can't get throughput. The energy costs are off the charts. They can't get more than, what, 600 wafers a day right now or something through. It's just not going to be used in a production facility. It's just cost prohibitive. Um, again, it's not the technology doesn't work. Technology works fine, but you're just not going to be able to pump the volume to justify the economics on it, is, is, is my argument. And finally, 400, um, 450 millimeter wafers. Uh, you know, these are giant platter sized wafers. I, I, other than, you know, NAND. Uh, memory products, I don't know, maybe microprocessors, I don't know what other product can justify that sort of volume on a throughput basis. So I'm actually bearish on all of these. Again, these are valid technologies, they're being developed, they will be developed, they probably will be used, but they will not be the, um, you know, the, the critical mass of the industry in terms of cost savings. Um, I, I think that uh, they're, they're going to prove to be very costly. Now, the um, other issue is the applications are narrowing. Um, it used to be all about smaller, better, faster. Think more power in your PC. Now it's all about low power. It's about small size. Uh, when you talk to somebody like TSMC, when they do a no uh, technology node now, they have three or four different flavors of that node. They have a high speed version, they have a low power version, they have a hybrid version, and then they have a subsequent generation that's a special hybrid version. So all of a sudden the world is getting a little bit more complicated. You have to tune your process for what your specific needs are. Um, and finally, um, the rise of cost-effective alternatives, uh, system in a package. Um, basically, if you can't build all this stuff on a single chip, what you start doing is sandwiching chips together in packages, and that's how you're building your system. Packaging was basically taking the chip and wrapping plastic around it. It was a low-value-add proposition in years past. Now it is becoming a higher-value-add proposition because you can't do it at the chip level, and you've got to make three or four layers of different products products and you've got to paste them together somehow, that's how your cell phone gets as thin as it does. So we see a huge shift into the packaging technology is now becoming a much more value add component to what's happening in the industry compared to what's just happening on the die space. Um, the other thing is called more than more. Basically, uh, think MEMS, microelectronics. Um, um, machining, uh, these are all of the movement things uh, in your cell phone that, you know, when you you flip it, it turns with you, and it senses all the motion. This is lagging technology, um, and it's heavily package-oriented. It has nothing to do with Moore's Law. Um, also, analog um, communication technology tends to also not scale with Moore's Law. Um, so Moore's Law is becoming more and more narrow in its use, and there's a lot of other things that are picking up the slack. So um, I think those are important. The, the issue with Moore's Law is one of economics. It's not technology, and the economics is what the problem is. In terms of graphing, I think, Julian, you're probably in a, in a better position to ask this, or, or Gary Economo with, with graphoid. Um, I, I don't, I think it's sort of been discredited as a semiconductor material because there's really no, there's no band gap there. Um, however, as a conductor, uh, it's almost unbeatable. So I, I think as um, um, uh, um, 
as an insulate as a, as a conducting material used in batteries, for example, um, or as a heat sink. I think that there's a lot of promise in in those particular areas. Uh, on the electronic side, maybe it's a conductive layer, um, but that probably wouldn't be a big uh, consumer of, of volume in the graphene space. So I think there's some potential in different areas, and it will energize certain things. Uh, but I, as far as I know, graphoid still still got a, a corner of the market and doing a lot of that in the lab. Um, 